So we are uh, continuing in the Gospel of John in chapter 4. Last week, we started the conversation of Jesus with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And I'd like for us to um, review that just a little bit, and then we'll do some reading of the passage. So um, I, who, how, let me put it this way. Let me just ask some questions, because I don't usually do that ask review questions. I know we have some note takers in here, and you could totally cheat and look at your notes. Um, but if I was to draw our map over here, we've got this map up here every time. Here's the Sea of Galilee, and we started at Bethany, and then went up into um, Galilee, this region here. Cana was where the water was turned into wine. That was Jesus' first miracle, and first sign that he performed. Then he goes down to Jerusalem, and why did he go to Jerusalem? Do y'all remember? It was for the Passover. He went there to celebrate the Passover. And while he was in Jerusalem, we get this awesome conversation that's so popular and famous between him and another man. And that in that conversation is John 3, 16. And who was that guy that he had the conversation with? We spent like five weeks beating that conversation to death. Who was that? Katie, you're uh -huh. muted. You just got to unmute. Oh. Nicodemus? Nicodemus. Very good. So... Um, he has this conversation with Nicodemus, then they leave Jerusalem, they go out into the countryside of Judea, and then last week we talked about him, he and his disciples leave, and they're headed to Galilee, but what did they have to go through to get to Galilee? What region? Samaria. Samaria. Right here between Judea and Galilee is this area called Samaria. Now, um, Samaria was originally the capital city of this region. It came to be known as the name for the whole region. It's a mountainous region, so we drew some, some mountains last week. They, they sort of go like this. And so to get from Galilee, from Judea to Galilee, you can either go around the long way this way or around the long way the other way, or you can just cut right through the center. And a lot of Jews in that day did not. Why would they not have wanted to go right through the center? What was their deal? with the Samaritans. They didn't associate with each other. That's right, that's right. In the ESV here, it says they, they had no dealings, had no dealings with Samaritans. Um, I mean, they hated their guts. And part of this, really all of this, is driven by theological differences. They, the Samaritans were left behind when the Israelites were taken into captivity and exile. They were exiled for 70 years before they were released and uh, allowed to come back to Israel. During that time, those that were left behind in Samaria intermingled, intermarried with the neighboring nations and brought in their false religions and worship of false gods. And so their doctrine really watered down. Um, they also, in, in an effort not to have to go to Jerusalem to worship at that temple, even after it was rebuilt, they built their own temple on a mountain there, on a mount, mountain called Mount Gerizim. Let me erase a little bit here in the middle so that we can, we can draw that. Our story takes place today. We're going to pick up where we left off in Sychar. And next to that is a mountain called Mount Gerizim. It was on that mountain that they had built a temple. So outside of Sychar is where Jesus comes upon Jacob's well. It sort of looks like this. It's got a stone over the top. It's not the like wishing well that you might find in somebody's garden. It's got a stone at the top, a little hole that goes into a bear chamber underneath, and then there's a wide hole that is the actual well. And one account that I read said that it was 30 yards deep with water just down here in the bottom at only five feet of water down at the bottom of that. And so you had to have a really long rope and a bucket to get it. And here comes Jesus. He does not have a bucket or a rope, and he just sits down next to the well. And then somebody comes up to him, and they don't address him. Jesus addresses them. And part of that is because this person is a Samaritan. They're not just a Samaritan. They're a Samaritan woman. This is my stick figure Samaritan woman dress, by the way. And she's got a bucket and a rope, and she's there to get water for her household but it's in the hottest part of the day. It says it's about the sixth hour. 
if we if we went back and reread that, which is about 12 noon. Um, the hottest part of the day is not when women went to get water out of the well. They would have gone earlier in the morning when it was cooler, later in the evening when it was cooler. They usually went as a, a group of friends because if you go out of town, they had to go outside the walls of the town, out into the fields to where this well was to get the water. And if they're there by themselves, they're not safe. And girls like to go do things together. Uh, they all get up from the table and go to the restroom together. It's that kind of thing. She comes alone in the middle of the day. What's the most likely reason that that was, based on what we know about her history that we learned last week? Probable she was kind of an outcast. Yeah. Of her. She was it's a social crazy. outcast because of her lifestyle. It's revealed um, to her that Jesus knows that she has had not just she she he asked her go get your husband and she says i have no husband um and he says you're right you've had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband so it's possible that each of those five men could have just divorced her of their own accord but that still wouldn't explain why she's living with another man that she's not married to and it would have been commonly known in that region, I mean, it's sort of like small town gossip kind of thing. Everybody in town would know this. And even if there were legitimate reasons for them to divorce her, that would have been looked down on by the other women in the community. So she comes in the middle of the day so that she can be alone. She doesn't want anybody to talk to her. But Jesus says, give me a drink. And she goes, no, wait a minute. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Plus I'm a woman. Plus, you're a rabbi, and we're all alone. We're not supposed to be talking to each other. And he says, look, if you knew who I was and what the gift of God was, you'd ask me, and I would give you living water. Now, we know that by living water, he's talking about salvation. But what does she take it as? She spring takes water. It, she takes it as spring water, correct. So this was a common phrase to say, you know, because like water down here at the bottom of the well is stagnant. It's dead water. Living water is like spring water. It's fresh. I don't know if you've ever been like right there at a spring where the water comes out of the rock and it's fresh. That's living water. And so she took it to mean, you know, spring water. And she looks around and goes, well, this is the only source of water here and you don't even have a bucket. Where are you going to get this water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who dug this well? And he begins to push this conversation out in an obviously spiritual direction. He says, the living water that I would give you would well up within you to eternal life. And she goes, well, give me that water so I don't have to keep coming here to this well every day. She's still thinking temporally. So he's got to get her to the position where she's understanding her spiritual condition and what she needs the most. So he says, go and get your husband. And they have that little conversation. And to avoid talking about sin, her sin, she changes the subject. She says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She says, remember this mountain over here? We're actually, she's within like eye shot. She can point up at that mountain and say, our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say we should worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus pulls the whole rug out from under that conversation and says, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And so in an effort to try and cut the conversation short, she says, I know that the Messiah will come. And I guess we'll go ahead and pick up there because that's where we ended up last week. Um, Matt, you're first on my list here. Please read for us John chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Very good. So here she's trying to sort of say, well, look, let's agree to disagree. This really smart guy named the Messiah is going to come later and he'll explain it all. I mean, one or the other of us will be right, but he'll settle the matter, which is really a concession on her part because the Samaritans didn't really believe in a Messiah that was coming. This was a Jewish thing. 
And the Samaritans, they only accepted the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch written by Moses, and hints at the Messiah coming. There are many types and forms and figures, but the prophecies and promises about the coming Messiah don't show up till later in the Old Testament. Like we see those pictures in the first five books, but we don't see them clearly described until later. And so really she's just saying, I'm going to give you this Jewish get out of jail free card. The Messiah is going to come. And he says something that blows her mind because he's already revealed to her that he knows her intimately in her heart. And then he says this, I who speak to you am he. And he is now claiming something that he has not claimed in his own words to anybody so far in the Gospel of John, that he himself is the Messiah. Now, it's sort of understood from what we've been learning about in the last three chapters, and, and there are other names given to him that he is the eternal Logos, the Word of God, that he's the light in the world, that he um, became flesh and dwelt among us. It, he's called the Son of God. He's called the Lamb of God. Um, and one of them uh, calls him, uh, he, yeah, one of them even says, we have found the Messiah. But we don't actually see Jesus say, I am the Messiah, until right here in John chapter 4. And who does he say it to? Does he proclaim it to the, the local news media? Does he go into the town itself and make this declaration? I mean, he could have also done this the very, at the the place of his very first sign when he turned the water into wine. And we don't see him saying that there either, but here he says it and it's just Jesus next to a well. And this woman who most people would say he shouldn't have even been talking to. And it's just the two of them. And that's who he says it to. And that's where we left off last week. So let's pick up reading. We're going to start in verse 27 and read all the way to verse 42. So, um, Matt, you didn't get to read enough. So you start at 27. If you'll please read the first paragraph, that's through verse 30. And then, Katie, if you'll read 31 through 38. There's a lot of red letters there. And then, uh, Alyssa, if you'll pick up at 39 and read to 32. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat uh, that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are four yet, there, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sour and reaper may rejoice together. For here, for, for here, the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we will know that this man is really the savior of the world. Very good. So time-wise, he's been having this conversation with this woman for the first half of John. Uh, uh, of this story in John chapter 4. And then right after he makes this claim, I who speak to you am he, it says just then the disciples return. 
So look, we need to flesh our picture out just a little bit more. Here's our well, and, and here's Jesus by the well, and here's the Samaritan woman. And it, this is a deep well, so it goes down there. And then way off here in the distance is the actual town of Sychar, because it's the, the well's outside the town. So here's, here's buildings in the town. And the disciples have gone into town to buy food. And if we remember, um, on, our, on our map, we're, we're uh, I erased the map. On our map, we're, we're going to Galilee, we've been in Judea, and we're, we're going through this mountain range of Samaria. And this is about a three-day journey. They stopped about halfway. So they've been probably marching for about a day and a half. It's noon, they're tired, they need food. Jesus stops here by the well and says, I'm just going to rest, maybe get some water if somebody comes by. You guys go into town and buy food. So we can already tell here, if they're going and buying food from Samaritans, they're a little more lax on the, um, I mean, really, this was a sort of a racist perspective between these two cultures. Um, they're a little more lax on that. They're at least, they're at least obeying their master. They, now, they might not have been as cool with going and buying food from Samaritans, but at least Jesus told them to go do it. So there's that. They've been gone. And right after he tells her, I who speak to you am he, then they come back. They arrived. Were his disciples even present for him to make this claim? Uh-uh. Now, they know, but we haven't seen here in the Gospel of John him say that. Now, he may have told them in as many words, but we haven't seen it yet. So then they come, and they see him talking with the woman. And I'm going to draw some disciples here, just so they're in the picture. Three disciples. Um, but no one stops her, and no one stops him. I mean, they could have come alongside Jesus and sort of like nudged him like this and said, dude, why are you talking to her? I, is she bothering you? Because we can, we can make her go away if this is an awkward thing. Like, like, we see you two alone out here. This isn't really appropriate. But they don't. They don't stop. They don't stop him. And they don't go to her and get in her face like they do with um, other people in, in some of these gospel stories um, and say, why are you speaking with him? Why? What, do you need something? Can we help you or do you need to go do something else? And they don't. They don't get in the way. And then she and her excitement, it says in verse 28, it says, so the woman left her water jar and went away into town. She leaves this bucket, the whole reason for even coming out here, she just leaves it on the ground and runs off. So I'm going to erase her and move her a little closer to town because Jesus and the disciples are going to have a little conversation now. But she runs off into town to go find her friends and tell them about this man who has been speaking to her. Now, what does she report to her friends? How does she describe what's happened? Matt, can you reread for me? Verse 29, it's your turn to read again. Okay. Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? She makes two points here. One, she says, he told me all that I ever did. Now, we already know that Jesus has described to her her very poor relationship status with five men that she's previously been married to, and there's one that she's living with and not married to. He understands and knows the sin in her life. And she is either speaking like my wife does when she's exaggerating a little bit, or she's telling the truth and saying, look, I've actually spent more time with him than was recorded here in the Gospel of John. We talked about more things. He told me all that I ever did. He looked inside my heart and knew me in a way that is only supernaturally possible. Can this really be the Christ? Why does she jump from he knows about my past in a supernatural way to the Messiah or the Christ? How does she make that jump? Well, in the Old Testament, and now mind you, this is not in the first five books of the Bible, but this was still commonly known about what was to be expected about the Messiah when he did come. One of those things that they expected from him was that he would be able to look inside of a man, look inside of a woman, and see who they really were on the inside. And we saw some examples of that in John chapter 1, where he sees Peter and says, I, I say to you, you are Simon Barjonas, but you will be called Peter. He could even see the future 
of what Peter was going to turn into as one of the foundational members of the New Testament church. But he also sees Nathaniel when Nathaniel is on his way and he looks in Nathaniel's heart and says, look, there is an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. He sees that he is a man of integrity. And Nathaniel's a little taken aback. How do you, even, how do you know me? I don't know you. But he could see in his heart. Well, we see prophecy about that in the book of Isaiah. So keep a finger in John chapter 4, and let's turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Um, if you flip to the center of your Bible and then just turn to the right a couple of books, you'll land on Isaiah. Um, Katie, I think you've got the same printing as me, and it's going to be on page 575, if that helps. So, um, quick pop quiz lesson. Isaiah and Jeremiah, we call the major prophets in the Old Testament. Who remembers why they're called major instead of minor prophets? They wrote a lot. They wrote more. They got really long books named after them. The minor prophets are just shorter. That doesn't mean they're more important. They just wrote more words. So in Isaiah chapter 11, we see Isaiah prophesying the word of the Lord about somebody here referred to as a shoot from the stump of Jesse. This is a very um, horticultural language here. This Jesse that it's talking about in this passage, this Jesse is the father of David. That's David and Goliath David. That's the David who came to become King David over all of Israel. His son was Solomon. King David was a warrior king. Solomon was a wise king of peace who built the temple, the, the, the first temple. And David was the one that God said to him that a descendant of his would reign on the throne of Israel forever. Ultimately, that prophecy is fulfilled in King Jesus. So that's who we're talking about here. When it says the shoot from the stump of Jesse, that means we're talking about the Messiah. Okay, so keep that in your mind as we read this passage. So um, I'll go ahead and read this, and y'all just follow along. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. So here, if let's focus in on verse 3 there, where it says, He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. Jewish um, scholars in that day, reading this passage, understood this to mean that the Messiah who came would be able to look at a person and supernaturally see and judge who they were, not by what they see on the outside, not by the words that they say or what other people tell them, but by what he sees in a man's heart. And that is what she, the woman at the well, is claiming about Jesus. He told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Now, Christ is that word that in Greek is what we call Messiah in Hebrew. So Messiah and Christos in the Greek are the same word. Both of them mean anointed and I know uh, we do this review like almost every week, but what threefold offices, what threefold office is meant by this word anointed when they say it, the anointed one? Who, who gets anointed in the Old Testament that all three of those roles would be fulfilled in the Messiah? Prophets, priests, and kings. Prophet, priest, and king. And what's the distinction between these three? A prophet is one who foretells the future and foretells the word of God, makes God's will 
known. A mm -hmm. uh, priest is uh, an intermediary, a uh, mediator between the people and God, uh, and a king rules and defends his people. That's right. So they were looking forward to somebody who would be the combination of all three of these roles. He would bring the words of God to the people in a way that had not been done before. He would bring the cares and the concerns and sacrifices and prayers of the people to God. Ultimately, Jesus acts as our high priest, making the final sacrifice on the cross for our sins and acting as our intermediary before the Father forever. And he would come as king a spiritual um, and sovereign leader over the earth. And that, that she says, so when she says, can he be the Christ? That's what she's talking about. All three of those wrapped into one person. Well, they listen to her testimony. I don't know why I'm erasing this picture. And they hear her and say, wow, that sounds great. That's exactly what I want. We need that man. And so here they are. I'm going to redraw the town I just erased. And so now she's returning, and they start following. In verse 30, it says, they went out of the town and were coming to him. So here's a whole crowd of people behind her, and they're coming to see Jesus. But Jesus is still over here by the well, um, and he's still having a conversation with his three disciples. And they haven't fully understood the situation yet. In verse 31, it says, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Remember, they went into town to get food. They come back, and he's still not eating the food that they went into town to get. So in verse 32, he says to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Now, last week, he uses the picture of water that was right there in a question, give me a drink, to push the conversation in a spiritual direction. Here he's using another word picture, this time food, to paint a spiritual picture for his disciples. They, just like the woman when Jesus did it to her, they get confused. They think he's talking about real food. In verse 33 it says, so the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? It's sort of like, you know, we didn't pass anybody on the way that could have given him food. And maybe somebody brought him food and then disappeared. And they're looking around the well going, I mean, is there, are there Burger King wrappers laying around? Is there, is there trash here? Wait, did he already eat? I mean, that was why he sent us to get food. And he, you got to know, he's probably like doing this number with his hands. Going, all right, guys, pay attention, Okay. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll, let's have Katie read. Katie, can you reread for us verses 34 um, and 35? Sure. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Good. He's using this word picture about food to teach them about what's most important, especially in this moment. What does he say his food is here? To do the will of his father. The will to do the father. will of the father. To do the will of the father. In fact, that's so much more important to him so much more nourishing to him, so much more core to who he sees, to how he sees his relationship is to the Father, that he would rather do that than even eat food. Now, this is the same Jesus who, at the end of his 40 days of temptation, 40 days in the wilderness fasting, then, then Satan comes at the end of that and tempts him. He even tempts him with food. After that, angels come and tend to him and care for his physical needs. He could have called on these angels at any time. He could have sent the disciples out, go get you guys some food. I'm going to have really nice, uh, some, I'm going to have basically angel DoorDash, bring me some food while you guys are gone, and I'm going to eat. He could have done that, but that wasn't what was important right here. He came through Samaria, and he didn't take those side routes around the mountains 
because he came to have this conversation right here with this woman and what follows after she brings all her friends to meet Jesus. That was all in his plan. And to him, that was more important than even eating food. Now, in addition to talking about the importance of the work here, he starts to use another word picture that is near and dear to my heart because I'm a gardener and I like to grow things. And so he takes an agricultural lesson for them. He says, do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Now, I started gardening two and a half years ago. Um, and it is the, the slowest hobby I have ever done. Literally, I go outside and I spend a lot of time and effort making these nice, pretty beds in the garden. They're sort of, they're not really raised. They're sort of mounded up because my yard floods. And it kills things. So it's mounded up and I go out and I plant seeds, right, in, in the bed. And then I walk in the house, no joke, every time I do this, I walk in the house and I go to my wife and I say, honey, do you think they sprouted yet? And she goes, no, no, honey, they're not sprouted yet. Okay. And then after dinner, I'll say, I'm going to go look in the garden and see if they've sprouted yet. And she goes, they haven't sprouted yet. All right. I mean, like it's days before you even begin to see the little tiniest sprouts come up. And then it, then they just sit there for another week while they grow roots like this. And then they don't really start growing until maybe two or three weeks later. And then you go out there and go, man, these plants are really pretty, but there is nothing on them to eat. It is the slowest hobby. And so he says, look, that's what it takes to grow food. You're worried about me eating this food. That's what it takes to grow food. But I want you to look up now. And he points off into the distance. Now, I've already erased the picture twice. So I'm not, not going to draw it. He points off into the distance and says, look, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white with harvest. Now, they were outside of the city here. They're sitting by this well, Jacob's well, and outside of the city is where they grew their crops. They didn't do that inside the city. They did that outside. In the, in the, so, like, I live here in Cartersville, right on the edge of the city, and it it goes from being city into agriculture. There's cows, there's corn, there's cotton. It's the same way here. They're sitting in the middle of all of that, but it's not harvest time. What he's pointing at are those people in the distance. Now I really have to draw it. He's pointing at those people that are coming in the distance. The town's back here, and here's all these people coming through, walking down the road, surrounded by the fields. Here's the lady leading them. And he says, look, the fields are white with harvest. And that's who he's pointing to. And the point he's making here, let's continue, let's continue to the end of this paragraph. He says, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. He says, look, these people are coming here to meet me, but they are going to be talking to you too. Y'all are my disciples. It's your job to teach them and to, to, um, to tell them about me so they can believe too. And they're on their way. And that whole process started not four months ago, but 30 minutes ago when I had a conversation with this one woman that you thought I shouldn't even be talking to. And it's happened already. The harvest is now already come, but you didn't sow this harvest. I did. However, you get to reap this harvest. And so one of the things that I brought up last week that I, I wanted to bring, we did, we brought it up right at the very end of, of class that I wanted to bring up again is that when we tell others about Jesus, it is most common for them to either say, thanks, I'm not interested, or you know what? You want to talk about sin. I do not want to talk about sin. Or they'll change the subject and talk about other spiritual things, but I don't really want to commit to following a guy named Jesus. And all of that sounds weird. Ultimately, they just reject the offer of the gospel. And that may happen the first time and the second time and the third time. But God may be continuing to work in their heart and bringing other people like you into their life to do a little gardening, so to speak. So that ultimately on the day when they are saved, when they do go, 
oh, I get the gospel, and I understand my need for a Savior, and I trust in Jesus for that, somebody is going to be there presenting the gospel to them and gets to reap that harvest. But not all of us are reapers. Some of us are going to be sowers, and all they're going to see is a rejection. Some of us are going to be like gardeners. They're going to come in and garden a little bit. And I'm not making, this isn't a word picture of my own. This came from a, a book called Tactics for Sharing Your Christian Faith. Um, I would say probably most of the interactions that you have with somebody in your life, you're going to be sowing or gardening. And very few are going to see reaping. But all of the people involved in that flow get to rejoice together and receive wages. Here he says, Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. What are their wages? Are they earning some special credit in heaven for doing that? No. Their wages are the pleasure of being able to participate in God's work of salvation on this earth. I mean, what an honor is that, that, that Jesus came to save sinners, and the Holy Spirit does the work in somebody's heart, but he only ever does that through the means of somebody telling somebody else the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. This is an honor that we get to even participate in that. What a pleasure that is. How exciting that is. And that's what he's telling them here. You guys now get to participate in something that started before you, and we get to rejoice together in the harvest that's about to be made. Now, I'm going to pause for a second before we read the that, that next paragraph and say, what do you guys think about that? What questions do you have? No thoughts. That's okay. We can continue. Um, I will say that book that, that, um, that I mentioned, that book called Tactics is a really good book. I think, Alyssa, you said you've read that in the past before. Um, maybe I'll put a link in the Bible study channel. And if you guys do, um, do want to read it, then I would recommend it. Um, it's not, it's not a memorize a script to tell somebody about Jesus kind of book. It is a, how do you just even go about starting the conversations with somebody about spiritual things? It's that kind of book. Um, it's not a psychological beat them over the head with the Bible kind of thing. It's not force them into a profession that's probably false kind of thing. It's how do we just go about starting these conversations? It's the same thing Jesus did right here. He says, give me a drink of water. And then that turned into, I am the Messiah. And then the disciples say, Here's some, have some food. And he goes, guys, you don't even know about the food that I eat that, that, that's most important to me. Okay? It's, it's those kind of tactics. So let's continue in verse 39. Um, Alyssa, can you reread for us verses 39 through 42? Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Very good. So here we're picking back up um, the involvement of the Samaritans in this story. And if we look back at where this started, she goes off to see them in town. In verse 29, she said, come and see. And this is something that I, I had meant to bring up and skipped over. She says, come and see. And we talked about this phrase back in John chapter 1 when Jesus' first disciples were coming to see him. John pointed, John the Baptist pointed to Christ and said, behold the Lamb of God. They went and followed him and said, Master, where are you staying? Basically, can we come? and spend some time with you. And he says, come and see. And then they repeat that when Philip goes to Nathaniel in John chapter one to invite him to come see this man who's the Messiah. And Nathaniel's sort of skeptical. And Philip says, come and see. You're not sure? You think this is a wild claim? Come and see and taste that the Lord is good. Here, this is what she's telling her friends, come and see. And so some believed based on her testimony. She said, Look, this is what God's done already in my life. And they said, that's what we want too. And they believed on Jesus. But <clears throat> many more followed her now out to the well. And they've come to witness for themselves. They came because she said, he told me all that I ever did. 
when they come, they say to him, please stay a while. Now, how, how much more time did he stay with them? Two days. Two days. So he's been on this three-day journey into Galilee where he's got more ministry to take care of when he gets there. And he took the shortcut through Samaria, straight up the center, but now he's going to stay two days longer. Remember, this is Sychar in the center of a land that the Jews don't even like being in because they don't like dealing with Samaritans. It's the town that's at the foot of the mountain that the temple is in that the Jews say you're not supposed to worship God in. And he's going to spend two days there teaching the people about this God that he told the woman, you must worship him in spirit and truth. So he stayed there for two more days. And in verse 41, it says, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Not that he's just a prophet. Not that he's just a nice a, a, a rabbi who teaches the words of God. This is the man who has come to save the world, and they believe on him. And, and I, I understand from this that this, is, this isn't a, a hollow profession of faith that this is actual possession of saving faith. That's why it's given here as an example. Now, what is the difference between professing to believe in Christ and that belief being um, uh, different from a belief that is actual saving faith? What's the difference there between those two? This is something we touched on a couple of times in class, but I want us to, I'm just going to ask and see what you guys remember from that. What's the difference between believing that Jesus is a real person and saving faith, saving belief? What's the difference there? I would say that um, saving faith is, first of all, repentance and turning your life um, completely in the opposite direction. And uh, also um, putting yourself under Jesus's lordship. So it has a lot to do with he now becomes the Lord of your life. Mm -hmm. It's not just, I believe that he is a man who is also God, but he becomes the Lord of your life because you're submitting to that Lordship. Good. These are good words. When we talk about repentance, repentance is like you said, it's, it's a turning around. It's a, I was going in the wrong direction and I'm going to turn around now and go in the right direction. Uh, critical there is understanding and admitting sin in your life. That's something that she had to do here, the woman at the well, admitting sin in her life in order to understand that she was lost and needed a Savior. The other part of that is saying, I don't want to do it anymore. Now, Repentance does not mean, in order for you to repent and believe and be saved, does not mean I've got to clean up all the bad stuff in my life, and then Jesus will be my Savior. Okay? That would mean that you have to do good in order to earn your salvation, which is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that it's believing and trusting on the righteousness of Jesus. It's trusting in His good works and the sacrifice that He made that actually saves. And that anything good in our life that comes out of that is a result of the Holy Spirit working in us after that salvation has already occurred. So repentance here is recognizing our sin, admitting that we're sinners, wanting to no longer do that anymore. That's that turning around part. And then this is also a daily thing. Repentance is not a one-time thing. It's not, well, I'm going to quit X and I'm going to do something else instead. It's an every day going, Holy Spirit, Show me the sin in my life. Show me where I need to um, stop doing the things that are displeasing to God and instead start doing the things that are pleasing to Him. So that's repentance. And then this, this right here, this is critical. You brought up um, making Jesus Lord of your life, saying, Jesus, I trust in you, not just as um, a good teacher from a long time ago who has nice moral things for me to think about on a, a on an occasion, or even to try to, maybe if I listen to him, I'll try to be a better person. Um, when you say, look, Jesus, you are the eternal logos. You are the eternal son of God. Um, you are God. 
And when you lived on this earth, you lived a perfect, righteous life. And I want you to be Lord over my life. I'm going to submit to you and understand and trust in your salvation rather than trying to do better on my own. That is saving faith. So there's, these are both, I'm glad you brought up both of those points because that's critical. Do y'all have anything else to add there? You think she covered it? Yeah, I agree. That was great. I, the, the, the word that popped into my mind again was obedience mm -hmm. and not as like you're saying, not that you need to do that in order to be saved, but that that's going to be a difference that you see as a result of that saving faith that, that God gives us. If you're not seeing that again, submitting obedience, then, mm -hmm. then that's not true faith. So I'm going to write, I'm going to write John three up here. Let's look at base because of that word obedience there. Let's look at John chapter three, the very last verse of John chapter three. So go to the beginning of four and then just go back one verse. We covered this two weeks ago. Um, John is having a conversation with some of his, John the Baptist is having a conversation with some of his disciples and then John the Evangelist, writing this gospel, goes on to sort of flesh that out some more. And in verse 36, he says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And so there's this direct tie between belief and obedience. That belief is not just an intellectual understanding. It's saying, Man, I trust in you as my Savior, and because I'm so grateful for what you've done, I'm now going to seek to try and learn the things that please you out of my gratitude for what you've done so that I obey you. Um, that there is, there is um, I think as it's put in First John, that faith without works is dead. In other words, if that faith does not lead to a change in who you are and what you do, then it's not actual saving faith. That doesn't mean you become a perfect person. Uh, we're not going to be glorified or made perfect completely until either we die or, and are in the presence of the Father or Christ returns and we're caught up in that moment. In either of those cases, we'll be what's called glorified until that day, that, that obedience, that repentance, that submitting is going to get stronger and stronger a little bit every single day. That's good. Um, there is one more thing I, I was going to add that I thought of after. Mm -hmm. um, I, will, I would also say that the saving faith itself is a gift. Um, so jumping a little bit ahead in John, John 6, 44, you know, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up on the last day. So that the fact that you even have that faith and have the ability to, um, to receive and rest on Christ is a gift in itself from the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you for adding that. Um, you know, in, in, our, in our fallen state, in, in the result of the first sin committed by Adam and Eve, we have within us at birth original sin, that root of sin, that word origin um, in the Greek um, comes from, from the word radical or radix, um, it meaning the root, at the very root of our hearts, there is sin. And that means that even at conception, that we're in this moral bondage to sin. And that if we're to reach up and to even grasp at salvation, to even trust in him, there's something that has to happen inside of us first. And that's why saving faith here is called a gift, that it's the gift of God. Um, that we even have faith in him. That's perfect. Thank you for bringing that up. Anything else? Well, this has turned out really well. I appreciate you guys um, reading along and participating. Um, and next, not next week, because we're not going to meet next week. Uh, unless you guys meet, I'm going to be at the beach. Y'all can meet. I'm going to be reading my Bible at the beach. I just won't be, because I don't think we have very good internet there. Um, so, um, we will pick back up and continue with John chapter four as Jesus goes into Galilee now and continues to perform signs and teach the people. And I don't know if we'll 
just finish four or if we'll finish four and then maybe do a little bit of five too. We'll just see how it goes. But that's the plan. Cool. Well, I will um, stop recording and then ask if anybody has anything to pray about. But I wanted to tell you all, thank you. And I love each of you. Um, and hopefully, if we ever get to have a, a retreat um, and meet in person, then I'll, I'll look forward to that too. So 